Friday or something. Is Bitcoin's path to 100K, uh, is that now off the table in 2024 as CPI data comes in hot? What does it mean for the crypto markets? Are we going to see a bigger sell-off as the talks of uh, no more than two rate cuts happening versus three to five, which was scheduled for the beginning of the year? Uh, how will the crypto markets react? We got Dan joining us from the chart, guys. It's going to break all the chart and price action down. We also have some news from Paris Blockchain Week as Sui introduces a pretty cool feature, a new device that is looking to bridge Web2 and Web3 gaming. We're gonna discuss that. Also, Joe Biden's plan to bring inflation down. Wait till you hear it, it's really, really good. Uh, also, <laughs> uh, we got a lot to talk about. Solana fixes are coming from the developers, but not for another potentially week or towards the end of the month. And also Phantom, is it getting ready for a massive explosion to the upside as whales are starting to accumulate? We have that and much, much more on today's episode of Sin City Crypto. Let's get right into it. Hola! It's your boy, Big Rob, back in the house. Welcome to Sin City Crypto. If it's your first time checking us out, we're the entertainment-focused cryptocurrency channel. We take old, boring, and, well, stale information that you typically are used to from other YouTube crypto channels, but we repackage that whole turkey up in a fun and sexy way. Uh, Bitcoin smelling 70,000 once again. That's all I got. Wow. Wow, thank you for that, Robin. Appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, every Wednesday, uh, we're joined, uh, well, most Wednesdays, we're joined by Dan from the chart, guys. Uh, we're going to bring him on right now. We're going to dig right into the markets. I know Bitcoin had a nasty wick down to, I believe, low 67s. Uh, Dan, how you doing, brother? Great. How you doing? We're great, man. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming back. Uh, we missed you last Wednesday, uh, but we're happy to have you here today. Bitcoin is currently trading at 69265 we know CPI data came in today. It came in hotter than expected. Um, a lot of people are worried that um, it's not transitory like they all told us three years ago. We all kind of knew that. But um, how have the markets reacted? Uh, can we take a look at Bitcoin and then maybe if you want to pivot to the traditional markets uh, before or after we look at a Bitcoin chart? Yeah, so Bitcoin, again, looking great. We were watching this uh, tightening range. Oftentimes, I condense it down to the two-day time frame. Let's do that. And it was a tightening range that broke bull. Uh, we didn't get the new all-time high. Bears playing some initial defense. That's not too surprising. But what's important here is back to the daily. Just need to set another quick daily higher low. Just keep these higher lows going. 59.2, 60.7. 64.5. And now if we can get a new one, it's 67.4. I mean, those are just your standard stair steps, a higher low every time on your way up, ideally. So there are no red flags at this point. And as you mentioned, we did drop with uh, the CPI reaction, but uh, it was one of the better bounces out there. If you look at you know the broader market and the NASDAQ and S&P 500, they all drop the same candle, but their bounces are you know much more in line with something like that right now, as opposed to the complete recovery. So hey, uh, definitely a solid bounce. Yeah. Um, I know this is a pretty rudimentary question, but uh, can you explain to people like what it means and why something like, like Bitcoin, for example, that scenario, it dipped so fast and then just immediately recovered. What does that tell you or what should people take away from that as far as, hey, uh, the psychology of the people trading what does it mean? That Does it mean that people have conviction in Bitcoin? Does it mean that uh, there's a lot of people waiting for dips to buy? Like, well, what should people take away from that? Yeah, good question. So this is the five minute time frame, so we can zoom into what was really happening. And, you know, we had this base down there uh, of where the bulls were attempting to establish support. And then you get the CPI reaction and it's just stop losses triggering is what it is. You know, there's, there's definitely some automated trading systems, algos and bots out there that will react based on what the broader market is doing. And so what I see here is, you know, some bots and algos doing what the S&P 500 is doing and then triggering stop losses for anybody that put their stop under the recent low. And then very quickly, you get nobody else that's going to sell. It's it's the bot reaction. It's the stop losses triggering. And then, you know, a lot of people uh, have been jumping on plays where, you know, anytime that we dip due to the broader stock market, I'm going to buy that dip. And as long as you're in an uptrend, 
uh, that keeps working out. And so it was just, you know, a, a really fast bounce and, and recovery from that point. And essentially, you know, yes, it was an impact of the broader market. Yes, we dropped with it. But again, bulls just ready to gobble that dip up, which they, they did with a four or five hour bounce at this point. Amazing. Um, I know um, Ethereum, Dan, was uh, looking like it was making a move up to $4,000. And then, of course, uh, CPI happened. Uh, what is the ETH chart looking at? Is it, is, it, uh, uh, is it looking strong? And then can you also take a look at the ETH versus Bitcoin chart? Uh, I know that I think that kind of bottomed uh, last week, potentially. Yeah. So anytime, you know, this this resistance break with zero follow through is obviously not ideal. We gave a lot of that back. Again, it's the same thing where, you know, you, you see a move up uh, to this degree and we go up, you know, 16%. That's pretty significant for something with the market cap size of Bitcoin or Ethereum. But we make that move up and bulls were essentially just just tired right at that resistance level and so didn't see any follow through. So again, same thing. If, if the bulls want to prove it, we need that daily higher low and clear that level and turn that into support. You know, it's been resistance a few times during this consolidation period. We topped out at 3676, 3682, and now 3729. So I would call that a resistance zone that we are battling. And it's a very different looking chart than Bitcoin. Um, and, and again, the ETH BTC chart shows us that we've had a lot of relative weakness. As you mentioned, we did see a nice bounce there. And that is really, you know, bulls really want to see the bounce at that level because that is the level where, you know, if we're looking at the weakest we've been on ETH compared to Bitcoin in the last, man, that's that's three years. Yeah, uh, that's the low that's being tested. You know, down here to to four nine, four seven nine, and just recently to four eight. So again, it's you know, I'm finding more and more that zone that support and resistance are zones when you're on t looking at longer term time frames, not just you know one specific level. And so you know, this is the ETH bulls trying to hold this zone. But if we're going to see anything convincing, we must confirm a weekly uptrend. All these bounces, yeah, nice and big. It's great. No higher low and higher high. It's always a lower high and then we give it back. We have to confirm a weekly uptrend on ETH BTC to have confidence that this base of support can hold. Amazing. Uh, Dan, I want to share my laptop real quick and then we'll jump back to yours. So uh, this is from Ali Charts. Not sure if you follow him, but uh, it said nothing has really changed for Cardano. Uh, ADA is exactly where it should be, consolidating between uh, 55 cents and 80 cents before I break out to a dollar 70. And uh, I think this is a fractal that was pulled from uh, late 2020 going into mid 2021 when Cardano had that massive rally from around uh, nine cents to over three uh, to almost uh, two two dollars and fifty cents. What is uh, what are you seeing on the Cardano chart? And there's a lot of chatter about Cardano is dead, and this is mainly from people who strictly look at the price action. Uh, what is the price action of Cardano telling you? Um, we know it's one of the bigger movers when it does get moving, but well, what what does it say there? Yeah, so I mean, you know, you can make excuses uh, if you want about the performance of of Cardano, but there's no way to slice it. It is underperforming significantly. And yes, that can change very quickly in the crypto space. We know how fast things can move and shift around. But uh, to say that, you know, the price action is doing anything that the bulls want is just not the case. Uh, there's a base of support, again, a support zone, 568, 571, 568, just now, you know, dropping down to those lows. So bulls are attempting to defend it. But again, you pull up the weekly chart, we've been pulling back for over a month now. And, you know, this is just, you look at ADA divided by BTC and we are testing the lowest, or I should say the weakest that ADA has been compared to BTC in the last, again, three plus years. And it's just, uh, it's not looking good. There's nothing on this chart that tells me that I should be looking at Cardano as a bull, as opposed to the 15 other coins that I can pull up that are clearly much stronger. And again, that can change very quickly, but we'll see it change. There's no need to try and nail a bottom. Show me some relative strength on the ADA BTC chart to get my attention if I'm looking bullish. But uh, again, it's been nothing but disappointment for months on end at this point. And uh, it's just, you have to prove it to me. Like, I'm not going to, you know, just, just hope that things turn. Show me things are turning, then I'll put some money into it. 
Yeah, and I completely understand that. Um, I think my biggest issue, and we're a little, getting a little off topic as far as charts go, is is people that, that only use price action as a measure of whether a project is a ghost chain or dead or not versus truly looking under the hood and seeing, hey, are people still building on it? Are they still onboarding users? Are the wallet uh, numbers growing? I know Cardano has one, been one of the most underperformers in the market uh, year to date, going all the way back to mid last year. Uh, but again, um, we've seen in the past when Cardano gets moving, as retail starts to come in, uh, the price starts to move. Um, can we take a look at ICP? Um, I had a bull flag on the daily on ICP. It did break below, um, but it looks like it's it's coming back into the pattern. And also, uh, that little hammer candle we see there typically signifies a reversal um, if, of course, it closes. What are you seeing on the ICP chart there, Dan? Yeah, so I see you know what you're talking about where initially the pullback was pretty healthy. This is a daily downtrend, lower high, lower low, zero bear follow through. And this leg down is giving a bit more bear follow through. If I go to the weekly perspective and use my FIB retracements to help determine if it's a bull flag or not, generally you want to see a retracement of 382 or less if the probabilities are going to favor continuation. And now that we're pulling back over 50% plus, that decreases the probability that it's going to be a bull flag. You know, a, a weekly high or low is still absolutely the most likely scenario. And you know, I love my EMA 12, and that's a good guide here that has been holding the whole way up. Uh, but it does diminish probabilities of bull flag a bit when the retracement exceeds 50%, as we have done here at this point. Awesome. Um, if you were to, of course, not any advice here, but if you were to enter into a position on ICP, would it be a long or a short? And uh, where would your stop loss and your take profit targets be? So because a weekly high or low is the most likely scenario, I would definitely uh, favor the long side, but I would zoom in. And, you know, I'm looking at this drop here. And for me, the most likely scenario on this bounce is just a four hour lower high. So again, I need some proof. Show me a big bounce. And okay, if you give me a big enough bounce, I'll scout the four hour high or low. I'll use the recent low as my stop. And then I will hope that the, the four hour trend change confirms. But of course, you know, my risk will be uh, clearly laid out in advance. At, the, at this point, this, this four hour bounce is not big enough. You know, get up to that EMA 12 resistance then it's a big enough bounce for me to scout that four hour high or low entry. And again, we know that trend change will be needed to get the daily bounce going. Uh, but I do like the weekly, you know, there's a lot of, of setups right now where the weekly high or low is the most likely scenario. So I then zoom in and scout for bullish patterns that show me the weekly high or low is shaping up. And just off the top here, RNDR, you know, had all that momentum as the AI play. Same thing, weekly EMA 12 support coming into play. A higher low is the most likely scenario. So I zoom into the daily and I keep an eye on this potential daily falling wedge. A falling wedge is a bullish pattern showing bear exhaustion. If the most likely scenario on the weekly is a higher low, I'm watching for this to be a potential daily bull flag trying to shape up. So I like that mindset, you know, starting zoomed out, what's the most likely scenario, a weekly higher low, and then you zoom in and look for a bullish pattern. You know, I would like to see ICP give me a, a daily inverse head and shoulders setup with a big enough bounce to scout the trend change on the daily or something along those lines. But uh, at this point, I need a little bit more upside on this bounce for the most likely scenarios to start shaping up in favor of the bulls. Amazing. Um, Dan, before we let you go, any any uh, trade setups uh, you, you got your eye on that you want to maybe share with us? Doesn't have to be necessarily crypto. I know you uh, deal a lot in the uh, traditional markets as well. Anything really kind of like stand out to you? Uh, so as I mentioned, RNDR, that's what I'm watching here. Soul, I just like the fact that Soul's a double bottom at 162. Mm. Uh, so same deal. Can this four hour bounce uh, give me a trend change? Right now we're just struggling on these bounces here, but give me a four hour trend change and I'll believe that 162 support a bit more. As far as outside the crypto world, CCJ is a uranium play. I'm watching for the possibility that this is a cup and handle. This is the all time high and just going back to, you know, uranium stocks have been on fire. This is the monthly chart. So years of some significant upside. But I'm just watching this, you know, all-time high little double top, but a big cup. And this is a bull flag attempt. Wow. Essentially, if this low holds, then we're looking for all-time high. So I like the fact that, you know, nice a asymmetrical risk setup where if, if 46.94 breaks that current low, I know I'm probably wrong. And I use that level as a stop. But if that level holds... We're looking up, you know, 52 and beyond for this 
uh, cup and handle to potentially play out. And, you know, I'm, I'm keeping an eye this, this year, cup and handles are shaping up the last 12 months or so more so than in a long period of time. Silver just did it on the weekly time frame with its massive breakout, uh, a little cup and handle right there. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's worth paying attention to. Generally, it's an oversubscribed pattern that everybody wants their name to be a cup and handle because that means breakout. But there are definitely uh, more common over the last, maybe 12 months is too long, but last eight months or so, seeing a lot of them. Yeah, that cup and handle. What was it? What was the ticker on that one? CCJ? CCJ. It's one of the leaders in the uranium space. Awesome. And uh, yeah, it's been... Uh, this name has been doing really well, even even in yeah, the 2022 bear market. You know, 2022 bear market has just tightened up all year and then just took off. And so, watching to see if if we can get continuation and all time highs. Those are monthly candles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's long amazing. uptrend. We love uptrends. That's always fun. Uh, Dan, thank you so <laughs> much, man. Uh, we love your analysis. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. If people want to uh, to have more Dan in the chart, guys, where can they find you? Chart Guys on YouTube and at Chart Guys on Twitter. Lots of content in all sectors, all corners of the market. Yeah, uh, your, your stuff, man, is, is top notch. We, we love having you on the show. We love it so much that we run our intro twice. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for joining us, man. It's always a pleasure, my friend. And um, we'll uh, see you next time. <laughs> Someone pushed the wrong button. Yeah. So we have a... a we're doing a, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you so much, Dan. We appreciate you. See you next time. All right, take care. Robin, would you like to say hello to some people? All right, uh, so if you are new here, say hello. We'll love to drop an old lot back at you. Uh, we do have just a couple new faces. We got Tony S, Matt C, HJM Construction. And, uh, of course, a big shout-out to Gary Ginzer. He's in the chat once again. What up, well, you. Hola! Welcome to Sin City Crypto. Uh, question, dude. Did they fix inflation? No. No? Biden's got some plans, though. Yes. Does he? You know, let's just jump right in. Oh, let's jump right so in. So excited. I'm sure you have some you want to share because you're very giddy over here. Yeah. Uh, so, from the <laughs> Bureau of Labor Statistics. Did you say Euro? Bureau. Oh, I love Euro. Can you spell Bureau? Before we get started, I want to give a uh, big hello to uh, Gravy Train. Gravy Train, how you doing? I'm good. I'm in the corner. It's so sad that they threw you in the corner. Robin mm. threw me in the corner. Robin? Naughty. I just spanked him. Oh, thank you. Anyway, uh, so happy to have you here. Uh, what are your thoughts on inflation? Are you paying more money uh, for, uh, for eggs and Capri Suns? Capri Suns are expensive. Do I know the actual price right now? No, I don't. But I know they're more expensive than they used to be. Is more money leaving your account when you go to the grocery store? Yes. What are you doing about it? Crying. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. That was kind of like a serious question, I guess. You know, people, uh, they're like, oh, inflation's only up 3.5%. Well, not really. Um, so, looking here from the BLS, as it is a lot of BS, but still, 3.5%, your CPI headline which means March from March of 2023 to March of 2024, inflation has gone up 3.5%. If we take out food and energy, well, because who needs food and energy? 3.8% um, from March 2023 to March of 2024, with the biggest gainers being tobacco and smoking products. I'm sorry, guys. Transportation services and... Okay, this is a big one. My insurance went up like 70 bucks a month. 70 bucks a month. And here's the crazy part, right? This is not something that you can just like, ah, I just, you know, steaks are like 60% like higher. I'm just not going to eat steak. It is required by law for you to have motor vehicle insurance. And so when you're forced to pay for a product and that product goes up by 22% year over year, what the hell are you supposed to do? Robin, what are you supposed to do? Not drive. <laughs> there you go. Uh, a couple other things I have here. So uh, CPI, again, year over year, up 3.5%, estimated 3.4. Core was estimated at 3.7, at 3.8. Now, month over month, 0.4%. Might not seem like a lot, but that's pretty big. 
0.4% again on the core as well. You know, there's a lot, a lot of theories out there that uh, inflation, you know, things are getting more expensive. But, uh, you know, actually, I think that uh, prices stay the same, especially on food. Here you have... The traditional meal still coming in at about two ninety nine, and the price it was wow. back in nineteen ninety nine. So, uh, inflation, inflation who exactly? And then also, uh, the uh, the White House has a plan for fixing inflation here, and the White House announces inflation doing great if you hold the chart upside down. And then lastly, uh, Biden did address. Uh, so Biden, he has said that inflation, well, let's blame the grocery stores. It is the grocery store's fault. That is, Shame on you, Kroger. It is. Freaking sprouts. Nothing to do with how much money we print. And then obviously he wants to share his economic vision with you. So this is the blueprint for our fiscal year of 2024. Outlook is great, man. Great outlook. Um, you know, listen to this. So. Yesterday, we saw the price of crypto and the markets start to, especially after markets on the stock side, start to go down. Well, uh, we have a reason for that. Key inflation data was leaked to BlackRock and JP Morgan by the BLS, allowing their traders to make market moving bets. Um, that's a fact that has been proven. Uh, also, it's from unusual whales, the typical American household would need to spend $445 more a month to purchase the same goods and services as a year ago. This is a report from Moody's, the credit rating agency. $450 a month. That's a car payment. That's your student loan payment. That's a credit card payment. That's uh, another box of panels. Also, um, Douglas Bonaparte has a good way uh, for you to save money on inflation. If you simply avoid gas, food, clothes, and other basic needs for survival, inflation shouldn't impact you. Okay? So, guys, stop pointing the finger, all right? Start taking it in your hands. Stop driving. Stop eating. Stop clothing yourself. Let's get back to, you know, uh, the year 500 BC. Also, we have a visual representation of the Fed stopping inflation. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the guy... The airport security was at the club, was waving people off. He was like, mm. the older guy. Anyways. No idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's get into, well, what are the markets expecting? Um, so I, this was about, uh, what, three weeks ago? I said, I don't think, not only do I think we'll not see three rate cuts, but I think we'll see a rate hike. Last month, when Jerome Powell came out after the FOMC, said, uh, yeah, we're expecting three cuts. I was like, okay, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. Maybe I'm back on track. Who knows? But current market expectation for the six remaining FOMC meetings this year, May, June, July pause, September 25, point, uh, 25 basis point cut, pause in November, and going into Christmas, another 25 basis point rate cut. We, uh, they were forecasting before the CPI print that the June meeting would bring us our first rate cut. And uh, the markets are saying, hey, uh, we don't believe that anymore. Uh, this is from Joseph Wang, who worked at the Fed for a long time. His book is really good. I read it, by the way. Great book. Uh, yes, transitory and, transitory and seasonal were wrong, but that misses the point. Those guys are doves, and they will find a reason to cut rates. Uh, piggybacking off of what Joe Biden said, uh, he calls on companies to use record profits to cut prices. Don't think that's how it works, Mr. Biden. Uh, inflation down more than 60% from peak, but more is needed, he says. Uh, and then also he said, inflation news may delay rate cut, but I don't know what the Fed will do, but, I, but there will be a rate cut before the end of the year. Funny he says that because the Federal Reserve is supposed to be a completely separate entity from any branch of government. They don't take orders from the president, from the State Department, from the Treasury. From anyone. They're their own sovereign entity who are free to make decisions based off what they believe is right for the economy. But Joe Biden saying there will be a rate cut before the end of the year. Very interesting there. That's because he's up for re-election. He knows that with rate cuts comes uh, more spending and generally a reversal in the trend of the market where you have a subdued 
economic uh, it spurs economic activity when you cut rates, right? People are incentivized to go out and spend money, and that is all a contributing factor to a strong economy uh, where people are borrowing, spending, and it's going to look good going into an election. An election is around the corner. So that's no surprise that the president's like, hey, rate cuts are coming because it is an absolute integral part to getting reelected. The voters are saying, hey, the economy is looking good. Such an integral part. Which is funny because the economy is reliant on spending, printing, borrowing, increasing debt basically destroying the economy in the long term instead of paying down your credit cards in the short term like responsible. Borrow more money, bro. Yeah. It's fine. It's going to be fine. We all, you know, we all go to the same place at the end. Um, and then the last thing I'll share on this inflation is uh, the FDIC is already getting ahead of um, whatever he's getting ahead of. We are ready if a big Wall Street bank ever failed. Wow. That's good to know. Thank you so much for that. Puts my mind at a lot of ease there. Um, all right. Let's talk about Bitcoin. Let's talk about Bitcoin's ETF. But first, before I talk about the ETF, I want to give a big thank you to today's channel sponsor, Decrypted.tax. Um, so obviously, uh, the government has no idea what they want to do with our money. They have no idea how to spend the money. And I mean the money that they get from our taxes. So keep more of that money and don't give less to Uncle Sam so you can do better things with it than the government will. How do you do that? Find a good tax professional that knows what the hell they're doing especially in the crypto space. And those people, we believe, are decrypted.tax. Click the link in the description of this video to set up a free one-hour consultation. The deadline is on Monday, and so uh, if you haven't gotten your affairs in order, at least give them a call, see what you can do as far as maybe filing a deadline or an extension or whatever you need to do to make sure you don't get penalized. All right. Uh, speaking of being penalized, uh, Grayscale continues to penalize us by selling off. Good job, Grayscale. Way to not budge on your absorbent 5X to fee that everyone else is having. Um, 154 million flowed out of GPTC again yesterday. Uh, BlackRock saw a big day after a terrible Tuesday, uh, or sorry, after a terrible Monday, as Tuesday they brought in $128.7 million in inflows, but a lot of nulls. Zero, 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 zero. So five zeros from uh, ARC, Invesco, Franklin Templeton, Valkyrie, Van Eck, and Wisdom Tree. Uh, so Fidelity and BlackRock have absolutely uh, just ran away with this thing. Uh, and I do want to share uh, this bullish piece of news. Hong Kong is set to approve a Bitcoin spot ETF next week. Uh, now, this might not seem like a big deal, but I think this person did a really good job of breaking this down. So shout out to Sins 21st Capital. Why Hong Kong's potential approval of spot Bitcoin ETF is the most significant development in the market right now. Goes on to say, China is grappling with a severe economic crisis characterized by soaring debt to GDP, which reached 288% in 2023. So uh, the one, one one I want to share here is uh, number six right here. So four China-listed ETFs tracking Japan's index have seen record trading volumes. Some investors have been buying funds that offer exposure to Japanese stocks at a 20% premium to what the stocks are worth. Chinese investors need a life raft. Uh, talking about strict capital uh, is starting to flow into other assets outside of the, the Chinese markets. So strict capital controls in China restrict the amount that individuals and institutions can invest abroad. This has led to the popularity of ETFs traded within China that provide exposure to international markets to soar. Um, and also, of course, we know uh, Hong Kong is the financial capital of China, some say of the entire Asian markets. Uh, and so again, this month, we're going to see an ETF approval from Hong Kong. Uh, Robin, we know China, the number two economy in the world. We briefly touched on this yesterday. But numbers show people in China are looking to... De so we talked about this yesterday. They're going through something called deflation where people just aren't spending money. There's, I think, 7 trillion yuan or dollars that are just sitting in accounts that aren't moving the economy. And so that's why you see a lot of uh, Chinese government is looking to inject capital and in, get people to spur money, spend spending. But they are spending money outside of the Chinese economy. And so they're looking to get exposure to things outside of their own country, outside of their own government. What are your thoughts on, on Hong Kong passing this? And how big could this be for, for Bitcoin? 
Yeah, I think the Hong Kong economy, I think, is it's almost at a trillion dollars in GDP. Uh, not not quite there, but they have one of the largest publicly traded markets there, which the uh, it's called the HKEX, and you know, there's it's the hub, the financial hub of of Asia, right? Uh, you know, it is an integral part of China, province of China, uh, and so they got absorbed back into China after. Uh, the lease ran up with the UK, but it is uh, in in its own it's its own financial uh, financial epicenter uh, at least there in China, and I think that a lot of people dismiss how much money moves through there, and so what we saw here in Wall Street, uh, sister market is Hong Kong, is in Singapore, and is in that area of the world. And they haven't had the exposure to crypto uh, and especially Bitcoin ETFs in the same way that we've seen here. And so with the launch of a potential ETF there in Hong Kong, we'll see massive inflows of Bitcoin into these, these products in the same way that we're seeing here. But the one difference is in Hong Kong, they don't have a grace here. There is no, there is no large custodial agent that's trying to rebalance the price and has a bunch of people trying to sell and people are made a lot of money with the premium uh, at, at some point in the history and time of Bitcoin. Basically, you have a new product to a new market. The new market happens to be the second strongest market globally. And what we saw here in the States is going to be replicated in, in Hong Kong. And then on top of that, there's no big seller like Grayscale. Grayscale has been subduing the uh, the inflows that we're seeing into BlackRock and Fidelity. BlackRock and Fidelity are buying an opious amount of Bitcoin every day. And this is getting negated by Grayscale. Maybe not in its entirety because we're seeing net positive inflows over time, but uh, it would be a lot stronger if Grayscale didn't exist, right? Well, here, we have another market Ooh. where there is no grayscale. we got breaking news, bro. And so there you go. Sorry to interrupt you. we got, got breaking it. news. Um, so big shout out to Bradley Clark. The SEC is suing Uniswap. Yeah, this I saw that. Just dropped right yeah. now. Uh, this is a tweet from Hayden, uh, Hayden, uh, Hayden Adams. So the founder of Uniswap said, Today Uniswap Labs received a Wells notice from the SEC. I'm not surprised, just annoyed, disappointed, and ready to fight. I'm confident that the products we offer are legal and that our work is on the right side of history. But it's been clear for a while that rather than working to create clear, informed rules, the SEC has decided to focus on attacking longtime good actors like Uniswap and Coinbase, all while letting bad actors like FTX slip by. Amen to that. Uh, I said, when I first set out to build Uniswap, the goal wasn't to reimagine finance. It was an experiment in radically decentralized, fully automated on-chain. Um, said, people often ask me why we stay in the U.S., and my answer is simple. I believe that blockchain is incredibly powerful technology. Um, said, the SEC's mission is protecting investors, maintaining fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitating capital formation. This is a noble mission. I would argue Uniswap does a far better job of this today than the SEC. Said, this fight will take years, may go all the way to the Supreme Court, and the future of financial technology and our industry hangs in the balance. If we stand together, we can win. Amen to that. I am going to go because I think Uniswap is selling off big time right now. Let's yeah, it's take down a 7%. Uh, now, keep in mind, uh, Wells Notice is not an actual, uh, it's not a lawsuit. So they haven't officially gotten sued yet. But Wells Notice is uh, basically the final step before the prosecution steps forward. It's basically saying, hey, we are investigating you. We have intention of suing. This is our our stance. Basically, yeah, look at this big lawsuit right here, is coming. That's uh, the uh, the big exchanges that got sued were all served Wells notices before the lawsuit. Coinbase uh, and Kraken are two examples there. So, uh, not officially getting sued yet, but it's pretty certain that it's around the corner. And you know, um, you know what, man? I'm just gonna say, Gary Gensler, fuck you. Um, yeah, I don't like to curse, but th this dude, man, he's gonna take another L on this. 
But here's the thing. Uh, I'm under the assumption that they're going they're suing the token and the the governance token, not so much the protocol, I guess would be my I, I and this is just breaking news, so just my my estimate would be hey, the SEC is going is claiming that the Uniswap token is a security. Maybe Maybe it does fit some of the security parameters. It's a governance token, so it lacks a lot of utility. And it basically gives the holders of the token say in the direction of the protocol. It's very similar to owning stock, where you have say in the company if you own a certain amount of stock. Uh, if you have enough stock or enough weight or enough percentage, you can have a seat at the board table, for example. Uh, the CEOs generally will have control majority of the stock and make decisions very similar to what you see in governance. So perhaps that's what they're going after. And as I mentioned, this is just my preliminary, just kind of thoughts here. Bro, shut your what? mouth. You know, this is bullshit. No, I'm saying that no, this is bullshit. No, I'm just saying that they're probably suing. I'm not saying it's not bullshit. I'm just saying they're probably suing over the, the token versus the protocol. He's going to take another L on this. No, uh, but don't you don't you agree that it doesn't matter what he's suing? The dude just wants to sue everyone. Yeah, that's true. He wants to sue everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I really like the mess. You know what? I'm gonna repost this and I'm gonna give this a uh, clapping emoji because this was really good, man. Uh, big shout out to Hayden uh, Hayden Adams. Um, I, as far as if you're a token holder of Uniswap. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much, guys. If anything, this uh, could potentially be a buying opportunity. I don't think that Uniswap is going to get shut down. Um, I, I just... And They're a decentralized protocol. You can't shut them down, right? We, we saw it with the Mixer services. Their, their code. Now, you can go after the foundation. You can go after Uniswap's founding members. You can, you can say that the token itself is a security and not allowed to be traded uh, on U.S. based exchanges, have those delisted, but you can't at its core pull down code that isn't controlled by someone on the internet. All right. Um, all right. So uh, again, like Rob mentioned, this is breaking news, so we don't have all the details, but I'm assuming part of it has to do with uh, if you guys remember last month, Uniswap announced that they'll be paying. A percentage of the volume and trading to the Uniswap token holders, which saw the price of Uniswap go from seven to over twelve dollars as far as the token. Um, and so, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Of course, we don't have all the information, but it's not something new. Something Gary Gensler's been doing. The dude is a straight up loser, bro. He's a loser. Talks about protecting investors. What a better way to protect investors than to be able to give them a place to trade peer to peer? where there's no risk of centralized entities who are going to go down. Guess what? If Uniswap goes down, you don't lose any money because you don't have money in Uniswap, right? You use Uniswap as a medium of exchange for you to give a token up to receive another token from another person or a liquidity pool versus something like FTX, who, as he mentioned, uh, they just let him slip by. So it's just funny how they talk from one side of their mouth and the other side at the same exact time. I want to go back to the ETF real quick. So there is now a difference of only 50,000 Bitcoin between BlackRock's holding and Grayscale's holding. I would like to note this number here, 316,000. This is how much Grayscale currently holds. Prior to the ETF, this number was $625,000. My friends, we have shedded $300,000 or 300,000 Bitcoin. And we still are, are almost at $70,000. Uh, that's not bullish. I don't know what it is. BlackRock currently holds 266,000 Bitcoin in three months. That is just, amazing. I mean, $18.3 billion in assets in Bitcoin. Uh, and then Fidelity, of course, coming in at number two with 150,000 Bitcoin held on behalf of, on behalf of their, uh, their shareholders. Right, and then here you can see all the fees. Grayscale, one point five. Everyone else under, at or under a quarter percent. With a lot of them running promos like zero percent until July thirty first. Even BlackRock, only point one two percent for the first six months, 
or until they reach $5 billion, which, of course, they have reached $5 billion. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's move on to this. So Paris Blockchain Week happened, and uh, Sui was there, and they just released a, uh, a new handheld gaming device with native Web3 gaming capabilities. And let's take a look at what this thing looks like. Kind of looks like a, what is it called? A PSP or PlayStation Portable, right? Uh, nobody uses that thing is so old. You're like, what does that look like? A Game Boy? Like, this is important, know. Robin. Look, it's, look. Uh, you see that? You see that part? Look at this part. Ready? What's that? Google, Facebook, Twitch, or Microsoft. You can choose an account. You don't have to create a wallet. Do this and do that. So uh, play your existing PC and mobile games on this thing. and Earn badges and rewards for Web 2 and Web 3. And you can own your own in-game assets. So Sui mm -hmm. Play. Um, I uh, yeah, it's pretty similar to there. There's uh, there's this. It's one is called the Stream Deck. Uh, that's a pretty popular handheld one. Also, you have the Asus ROG. I think that one is probably the most popular. Basically, it's a miniaturized computer that is optimized to play games versus run Photoshop and other applications and web browsing. Uh, so. That essentially is a laptop. You know, bought one for my son, and it's a laptop, but without the keyboard and mouse, you have joysticks and the apps that that lead into downloading the games are kind of built into it, and so it makes a friendly user face or interface. So pretty bullish. I I don't know. I. I like the phone better, put it that way. I think the phone is a little bit... So you want to come out with Sui phone? No, I'm just saying I, I, don't, I don't look at it as some giant market adopter. Because even like the Asus ROG and the Stream Deck, it's a very niche-driven product, right? Every individual, most adults, especially in the modern countries, pretty much all have cell phones, right? How many people have handheld gaming devices? And I'm not saying that this isn't a good step forward, but I just, I find it hard to believe that people will adopt this. I feel like this will be a product that maybe only a few thousand people purchase. I don't think it will be widely adopted. Uh, even the Asus ROG, as I was mentioning, they just slashed prices. They reduced it down by uh, like 20% or 30% on the price from where it was last Christmas. And so, uh, yeah, those are... Hard to sell, I'll just put it that way. It's not a lot of demand for them. Uh, then also on the, on the Sui network, uh, they did have a new stablecoin issue. So a Hong Kong-based stablecoin issuer expands to Sui network. And so the FDUSD, uh, which is by uh, First Digital, uh, they are launching a stablecoin. So you know, big liquidity comes to stablecoin. Yeah, so this... The ecosystem has grown. Uh, I, I don't want to dismiss. Uh, I don't want to dismiss new hardware as hey, it's unimportant. We're seeing you do it all the time. I, you I, literally I, I do, do it all the time. I, I actually do, but I, I, I would like to. I would like to pivot and say I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying that for the grand scheme of things, for the price action, I just think this is going to be a drop in the bucket for what could move the price. I think it's a non-factor if, if that's what you're concerned about. But if you're looking for direction of the company, I think it's very positive. Uh, let's see if it has moved the price. You know, I, I shared a tweet yesterday. So Sui uh, has not moved the price. It's actually moved the price down. Uh, but uh, I did share this. Uh, I tweeted this yesterday. So we had that dip. Uh, picked up some more ICP near, and I decided to uh, pick up a bag of Sui, my first purchase of Sui, uh, seeing a lot of money flowing into Sui. It's currently part of my sell this cycle bag. What happy with a three to five X? And then that news dropped uh, today. So it's pretty good. Uh, and then uh, what Rand Nooner from Crypto Banter tweeted, uh, a bridge assets from any chain, uh, full ownership, ZK login, royalty enforcement, and then of course, web two and web three games. I think this is overall a net positive. Um, all right, let's jump into uh, some news here. So I want to share this pretty big Coinbase UK integrates 
uh, Apple Pay for payments on their uh, on the saw that. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty big. This development allows users based in the United Kingdom to take advantage of the Apple Pay function on their iPhone to purchase Bitcoin, ETH, and other digital currencies that are available on Coinbase in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is pretty big, right, Robin? Um, say a lot of banks, right? At least here in the U.S., a lot of banks are uh, are closing people's accounts that have anything to do with crypto. People are getting notifications saying, hey, we got fraud, we're shutting you, we're, we're, we're halting your account. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, you sent money to Coinbase. Yeah, that, that was me. That was me, but it doesn't matter. So is it for onboarding? I, I didn't go through the details of this. Payments. So if you want to buy, so let's say right now you're on Coinbase here in the US and you want to buy from the Coinbase uh, app, you have to link your account or you can wire transfer, right? With this one, it has the Apple Pay option. You just click Apple Pay, just like you do anything that has Apple so Pay. So you can, you can add your Coinbase account to your basic no, your Apple No, Apple Pay wallet. is available on Coinbase now. So if you're on Coinbase, one of the options to buy crypto is through Apple That's Pay. what I was saying, onboarding. Yeah. yeah. That's what I said. You said no. Oh, yeah. So you can onboard and offboard with, with Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. That's good. I would love to see that here in the States. I know... The SEC would not let give the green light or let that fly. I feel like, which but it makes no sense, man. I mean, does it really matter how your money comes on or off these exchanges? Coinbase, publicly traded company here in the United States. If I can fund my account through my bank account, why can't I fund my account through my Apple Pay account? Because Robin, because it's still tied into my my checking account, right? Or Generally, most most of the Apple Pay is tied into your checking account. You can fund it with the the Apple Pay uh, dollars, the, like the gift card dollars. What are, what are those called? Uh oh yeah yeah I know what you're talking about. You know I don't know if they were called anything, but they were Apple dollars. Hmm. Apple. What about gravy train? Gravy train. What are those things called? The Apple Pay dollars. Yeah, we're kind of old here. So. Yeah. Apple Pay dollars. Yeah. What are you he... talking about? So, Apple Cash. Yeah. Apple Cash. There it is. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like apples and I like cash. Uh, there you go. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, we'll, uh, we'll send you some apple cash later. Hmm. Interesting. Robin's always spending our money. Uh, all right. So I heard someone say, hey, uh, Apple Pay has been available on a lot of major centralized exchanges here in the UK uh, for a long time. Milky, thank you for that comment, my friend. I think the uh, big one here is, of course, at least here in the States, Coinbase is the largest exchange. Uh, we believe it to be out of all the the exchanges here, right? If you were to rate them on a level of a safety, I think Coinbase is up there, number one. Coinbase it's has been around for... <laughs> Coinbase has been around since 2013. And so since that time, we've had Mt. Gox come and go, FTX come and go, uh, Quadriga come and go. You had all of the other custodial agents, uh, Celsius, BlockFi, and... There's been one that, well, stood the test of time, and that's been Coinbase. So uh, hate them or love them, well, they've been around longer than most other exchanges. I mean, keep, in, keep in mind that Binance really came to power in 2017. So they haven't even really had a longer run than seven years. And so you have someone that's been around for 11, uh, been around for almost three cycles now. Uh, so for me, I look at, time in the market as a safety blanket because as these new money come and go they haven't stood the test of time um and i and like i said i think coinbase ranks number one at least for me in terms of um if i am going to use a centralized exchange i am going to leave some money on a centralized exchange which we recommend you keep a vast majority of your coins off centralized exchanges and learn to custody them yourself um, i think coinbase is the best option out there at least here in the u.s um, I want to share this piece of news. Um, so we know Solana has been kind of failing transactions. No bueno. Um, so the devs are moving to permanently fix network congestion debacle, but there could be more problems. Yay. Oh, they're, they're planning on fixing it. Yeah. They're, they asked, there you go. They asked all the uh, developers to uh, slash the prices. However, in search of a solution, Solana developers are implementing multiple measures, including software patches and other guardrails, to address the challenge, bug fixes, say, quote, from Austin Federa, the strategy lead at Solana Foundation, bug fixes are rolling out over the next week and things will start to improve. It appears that the community will fast track the release of version 1.18 before the end of April, which developers say will improve transaction scheduling. Also, I would like to share that Jupiter 
the largest decentralized exchange aggregator on Solana has come out and said that they've identified certain wallets uh, that are just spamming the network and they've quelled a lot of those transactions. So uh, if you're trying to push That's something That's whack-a-mole, bro. That's whack-a-mole. I'm just saying. You, you're, you're saying like, hey, this wallet is spamming and you, and you close them, then five more pop up. You leave whack-a-mole out of this. Anyways, Austin continued to say, quote, we expect demand will continue to increase, which will require more work to scale up systems to meet this demand. This is what scaling looks like. It's not a one and done operation. What do you say to that, Robin? I kind of, I kind of shared my thoughts yesterday. You really didn't. Solana, this 75% failed transactions. Um, I mean, I shared my thoughts yesterday. Yesterday I said that the transaction volume is minute to where it's going to be in the later stages of the bull market. Retail has not come into full force. What we've seen is institutions, we've seen traditional investors, and we haven't seen the people like to, that like to play around on blockchain here in, in the way that they were back in 2021. A lot of people were minting NFTs, people that were just experimenting with blockchain for the first time. That's what we saw in 2021. That's why the Ethereum network got as congested as it was. And if you look at where we're at right now with Solana, well, we're in the early stages of the bull market. The average individual that's blockchain fanatic, those people aren't here yet. And what happens when they show up? What happens when you have these really cool music NFTs dropping out there? When, what happens when there's some kind of video uh, service that is uh, provided by uh, some of these layer ones? What happens when DeFi really takes off? What happens when an ETF launches that are basically runs on a layer one? I mean, imagine the throughput that you'll see on Ethereum if, if the ETF were to go live, just as one example. Well, what happens when the retail comes in and people start using the networks because right now it's Fired just answer. the it's answer. just the degens it's just the degens that are playing around right now it's it's the nerds what happens when the everyday user is using blockchain and they don't even know what it the nerds i'm using it yeah you're a nerd so what i'm saying is that if you can't stay up right now good well, luck I can stay up it's like having a dam and you're building it out of logs and, and pieces and, and bundles of grass and you're trying to block this little trickle of river. Maybe it's working. There's a little bit of water coming through. But just imagine when high tide comes and that little trickle, that little stream is a full-blown lake. You can't hold that back without a proper infrastructure. And so right now the job might work okay, but this is a very small amount of transactions. Are you bearish to on Solana? It sounds like you're bearish on Solana. I'm bearish on their situation as it exists right now. I, what happens with technology and software is that it evolves. There's patches. There's upgrades. There's developers that are changing, adapting. I would hope that this happens in an efficient and timely manner and that the network can adjust to the demands but as we know, with blockchain, look no further than Ethereum. It is very hard to modify a blockchain after it's been released and after it's ongoing. There's no, you can't just shut down a network, completely redo it, and then boot it back up. That's not how blockchain works. It's called blockchain for a simple reason, because, hey, I validate this block one after another, and it needs to be consistent. You can't just turn the whole damn network off redo it, and then upload it. We can't go from Windows Vista to Windows 99 or 98 or 2004, or whichever Windows 11 or whichever one we're at. What is that, Robin? It's a fire emoji. And a? Dancing emoji. Thank you. Fire dancer. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying, with upgrades, the next one being Fire Dancer, perhaps they address the situation. Perhaps they fix it. But am I wrong for looking at Ethereum and saying, hey. Yes, you're wrong. Am I wrong for looking at Ethereum and saying, hey, the, promise, the, the promise of upgrades doesn't always equate to this, it's going to be fixed. 
How many times have we heard that, hey, Ethereum's upgrade, wait till this happens, and then what happens? Everything's the damn same, if not worse than it was before. Before, we were talking about decentralized Ethereum, and now we're talking about centralized security-based Ethereum. We're talking about lower transactions, and we're still talking about lower transactions in the future because these things are pricing out the market. I am gassed talking about how many times Solana has went out and how it's going to be different. Nothing has changed. It's different this time. Trust it's me. not different this time. Trust in me, 2019... Bro. The market, or excuse me, in 2021, the Solana ecosystem went down over and over again. It is three years later, and it is still going down. It's not going down. It is still uh, not it's just operating. just not doing transactions. <laughs> Look, um, I'm still bullish on Solana long term, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not one of these Solana maxis. I'm not, I'm not really a maxi of anything, right? If uh, I, You know me, I'm a big fan of Near Protocol, Chainlink. If something transpired, uh, then I have a right to change my opinion. And with Solana... You have changed your opinion. Before, you were saying that Fire Dancer is the end-all, be-all, the, the second coming of Satoshi Solana Moto. And, <laughs> and so, I, just, I and now, now you think that... I don't it, think you understand, Robin, what Fire Dancer is going you, to do. That are, you take these... These blueprints and roadmaps and white papers and you just assume that everything is just fixed and it just moves forward. Just your chain link call is that it's going to it's gonna plug every toaster and smart fridge and every cell phone and bank. It's going to, everything's going to be interoperable and no need for anything else on the planet. But, and then you think that the fire dancer is going to be the end all resolution, the it's the Pepto Dismal to your. What's in, a Pepto Dismal? Pepto Dismal. 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 Yeah. The pink stuff. Anyways, it cures diarrhea, upset stomach, nausea, indigestion, heartburn. What does uh, this have to do with what you're talking about? But what I'm Thank saying you, is that okay. he's saying that Fire Dancer is the fix-all to Solana. The thing's got a host of problems a mile long. And you think that one upgrade is going to address everything. What are the other... Through. Okay, okay. Let's have this conversation here. What are the other problems Solana has outside of failed transactions? And the network going down because there's too many transactions. Off the top I, of your head. I you're am not... Uh, I you am don't not, know uh, because there's nothing. There's literally nothing. If I say, hey, Robin, look, you got a six-inch gash on your arm. You're not going to be like, oh, let me figure out how to fix this. No, you can know exactly what to do. And that is go get stitches. How do you exactly That is go get stitches. No. With the network you liquid congested. liquid Band-Aid. You don't use liquid duct band -Aid. tape. When you have a problem. A tourniquet. And, and the solution is like obvious. There's like, okay, cool. I need to go to the hospital. Get some stitches. Solana has been going down because of DDoS attacks and people flooding the network with transactions. What okay. is DDoS attack? DDoS attack is just a lot of transactions. It's just it's a lot of the activity. Network. And so replace DDoS attack with a lot of people using the network. What do you it's think? the same damn thing. Exactly, that's my point. And when you have a validator client like Fire Dancer who is going to alleviate that, in theory, in theory, it's being tested right now. Yeah, everything's testnet, in theory. The testnet has been out. In for theory, a you're intellectual. In I theory, I am intellectual. In you theory, I have great theory. analogies. Yes. In theory, yeah, in theory, that's, that's been proven. There's a lot of theories. Time, time again. I'm just saying, it's in testnet. It's literally going to fix the exact problem that Solana has been going through. Whether you go back to 2021 or you stay here in 2024, I believe it when I see it. Okay, fine. Go watch it now. It's on the test net. I'm going to go watch it. I'm going to go watch the blockchain. I'm going to plug into the computer. We're going to do Neo from the Matrix. I'm going to look at the numbers dropping down in the green little, little ticker way. And I'm going to watch it. Anyways, to those of you that don't know Fire Dancer, I would recommend just spend some time and research it, okay? Could something go wrong? Of course it can. Can it not work? Sure. But there's a reason why they're in, it's been in testing for the last two, three months, and it's going to continue to be in testing for the next two and three months. Once it goes live, I don't think you guys understand the capabilities and what it's going to bring to Solana as a validator client. It's going to be massive. It's going to allow, I think the numbers they threw out there, um, the required hardware to run a Solana validator client 
a validator node is gonna drop significantly to where even if you bought a computer like Robin did from 2005, a Dell computer I might add, um, you're still gonna be able to run a validator node on that laptop and you can, and I can get into this all day. I did do a video on this, you should go watch it. Um, but very bullish on uh, Fire Dancer coming up. Um, so yeah. I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying that it's not a fix, I'm not saying that it's not, that it's not needed. I'm not saying that it's not going to address issues. I'm just saying that I think there is a host of problems, very complex, top down. And what I've seen with other layer ones, particularly Ethereum, where they roll out some new upgrade or hard fork, it doesn't essentially fix the, all the problems at bay. It addresses certain parts of it. A lot of times new problems arise with hard forks. Simply all I'm saying, I won't hold my breath because I look at I look at my investments as, hey, there is over a hundred cryptos that I am eyeballing, that I am targeting. It is like there's a host of of different choices out there. And why take some uncertain risk? Why buy Uniswap right now if there's uncertain risk on the litigation? Why pick up Solana if there's uncertainty? on if this fire dancer will fix the damn thing. You have certainty that it will. I don't, I, I hold, I'm i like, hey man, I've seen what happens with hard forks. They don't always run off smoothly as expected. And there's a lot of intricacies when it comes to layer one blockchains. So for that reason, I'd rather just look elsewhere in the meantime. And then you know what, if I lose a few dollars because I get in a little later, I would rather wait to see till fire dancer comes out I'd rather wait to see, hey, is the problems fixed before I jump back into that ecosystem. That's mm -hmm. just my personal investment strategy. Say that to the you people. You can take a little bit more risk. Now, I just think at where Solana is at right now, as far as its price and its positioning on the on the market cap list, the returns I think are going to be subdued to what what you can get with smaller projects. I think you're taking on a lot more risk without the potential upside because of how overbought it is recently. You saw the big run up I and mean, we went from $10 to over 200 bucks. 20x. And if people are listening to you, they would have not bought Solana. Yeah, but I, I know I'm saying at this point, the risk versus re reward is swung completely opposite direction. I mean, it's not going to 20 it's not going to 10x from here. It's not going to go to $2,000. It's gonna go to three. But it could take a significant step back if Fire Dancer comes out, has issues, or the downtimes persist, especially in a, in a, a market that we know is gonna increase in volume, transaction, adoption, retail uh, usage. And so, I don't know, will Solana hold up? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And for me, I'm just gonna look elsewhere. You know, um, one thing I would like to note, and I'll end it with this, is, if all the transactions, because you guys remember, Solana does not have any layer twos. Every single transaction, whether it's a voting transaction, non-voting transaction, token transfer, token creation, it is all settled on the layer one. Imagine if that kind of volume was all settled on the Ethereum layer one, like it is on Solana. ETH would be going down more than Solana. I can guarantee you that. Uh, all right. But why don't? But real quick. But why don't they do? Why don't they do the layer ones on Ethereum, right? Because you're affecting security and you could have problems. So that's why okay, every Ethereum literally can't handle it. Well, uh, well. Here's the thing. You, you, you. The the theory behind doing the layer twos is that you don't mess with the base layer, right? You keep the security, or because change the, layer the base layer. Handle it. But no, no. I'm just saying. If you change the base layer at its core, if you break that, everything is broken. If you leave the base layer alone, the same thing with Bitcoin, for example. You don't change the layer one. You don't change Bitcoin. You don't, you don't increase the block size. We saw what happens when you try to do that. What you do is you create smart contract platforms that build on top of it, like stacks. Or, hey, we need to process more transactions. But that's a point of failure you're introducing. Not on the base layer. Yes, it is. Bitcoin Robin, can't fail. Robin, if, so you're telling me you see the, the stream deck? Okay, I'm going to talk in your language. This stream deck, would it be more secure and reliable if it had just one cord going to the computer versus three different extensions? There, there. Answer that question. Okay, so you're telling me that Bitcoin becomes more... It is more secure 
to settle ex directly on the layer one than it is to use a layer but two I'm or not, layer three. I'm, not, I'm, talking, I'm talking about your transaction. Your transaction is more secure settling on Bitcoin. But if you're going to build something new, if you're going to change the protocol, if you want to process more transactions for a cheaper price, it is a better idea to build it on a layer two and put it on top of layer one, right? What, that's, what, that's what Lightning Network does, right? When it Instead comes of changing, okay, there's a problem here. Let's just say there's a problem with Bitcoin. Let's just rewind to 2016, right? There's a problem with Bitcoin. It costs way too much money to send a transaction if you want to send multiple transactions. Let's say you want to send 50 transactions today. To do that on the layer one blockchain on Bitcoin, it costs a lot of money. It's not worth it. So let's, let's find a solution. Let's do Lightning Network. Let's process a bunch of transactions in a batch. Then we settle that on the layer one. And so you don't compromise the layer one. You don't change the layer one. You don't increase the block size and create Bitcoin Cash. You keep the layer one exactly true to what it is, and then you build on top of it. And what happens when you start changing the base layer? You get hard forks that people don't agree with. And so what I'm saying is that hard forking the base layer with Fire Dancer might not be the best idea out there. Maybe we end up with some hard fork and the developers or, and the people that are that are validating the network or whatever it is don't agree with the direction and maybe they don't like Fire. I'm just saying that you're introducing a host of problems, which when you build a layer two, if that doesn't work, you just leave the layer two alone. I don't think, uh, I could be wrong. I don't think Fire Dance is going to... Uh... Doesn't, it's not going to need a hard fork. But that's what I'm saying. They're changing the protocol. They're, they're, they're just adding a validator client. That's all they're doing. They're adding but a validator. They're, but they're adding, the, they're adding a validator client. What if they change the, how the mining works on Bitcoin? That's, that might not, that's going to introduce, I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's a potential for I get, issue. I get what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. My all I'm saying is that, like, okay, what happened when the ETF went live? We were like, we didn't, we didn't see this grayscale selling coming, man. Like, I, we should have known. And all I'm saying is, like, hey, man, they're doing a massive change. And in hindsight, we could be like, man, how did we not know that the layer one was going to, changing how they validate transactions on the, ba on the base layer was going to be an issue. That's all I'm saying is that maybe we should think about it. Maybe we should say, hey, man, man maybe this is not going to be 100% for certain an absolute positive bullish scenario for, for, the, for the chain. Maybe it's not. That's all I'm saying is think about these things. I uh, will respectfully disagree. I don't think uh, with a validator client you're changing anything on the network. Um, I think you're just adding, uh, you're just giving us some turbo boost. That's all you're doing. You're not changing the component of the engine here. Uh, but th yes, of course, anything can go wrong. That remains to be seen. Uh, I'm so bullish on Solana. I think they're onboarding new users. But yes, it is, uh, it's not okay to have 75% of your transactions fail and get people stuck in your, in your projects and on your chain without being able to use their money, especially if you're running a business, right? I saw a tweet uh, yesterday. But anyways, that'll do it for today's show, you guys. Um, got a Cardano video coming out later today. Uh, it'll go to the members first um, in about the next five to 10 minutes. A um, lot of talk about uh, Cardano is dead. Uh, Cardano for real this time, guys, for real. I promise. It's not like last time. This time it's for real, for reals, for reals times five. Um, that is a very uneducated stance to take because the people that say that are strictly looking at the price. And well, let me tell you something. Um, if you own a restaurant and... Uh, how do you gauge whether your restaurant is failing, whether no one likes it? People stop coming there. People stop eating there. Well, guess what? People are continuing to come to Cardano. People are continuing to eat at Cardano. Cardano is a restaurant. It would be flourishing. And um, so that is one thing. Even though the revenue might not be going up, people are still going. People are still building. Uh, and that is a video that we made. Um, so you're definitely going to want to watch it, especially if you're a Cardano fan. Uh, and uh, yeah, with that being said, um, go follow us on Twitter at SinCityCrypto1. And a big shout out to Dan for joining us. And big shout out to Gravy Train and, of course, our production team. Got our friend Chase and Rocco back there. Um, all right, Rocco, remember the outro button, not the intro button, okay? <laughs> but the guy, no, come on. I know you got something smart to say. Come on, say it. Come on. <laughs> Nothing to say. Mm. <laughs> I oblige.
Where's the music? Sin City Crypto Cash is Cuve yeah. Sin City Crypto Everybody know we here for Entertainment and info Gonna show you how to get that big dough So every day stay tapped in For big facts, no capping With Bitcoin, if you're in then you win We divide the pot with no fraction It's Big Rob, David I spit the game but they gave it Name the coin that's your favorite. I got dry powder, why save it? To the OGs, new beginners. Special shout out to the well members. Buy dip, sell winners. Ain't really nothing you can tell sinners. Tune in for the latest new flavors. They gonna teach us mean coins. They polarizing like barbecue chicken pizzas. I laugh with a major grin. Laggers, we trade them in. Baddies, they came to sin. And sinners gonna play the win. Screaming, hola, till my bags are flowing over. Hold ya to the moon and to the solar. Won't I? Don't be letting fall. Control ya, it's over when the finger tornado close ya. <laughs>